Hey yo, hey yo, it is actually the next day from the clips that I filmed yesterday that you just saw. A lot of stuff happened, you know, life. That's just kind of how it goes. Anyways, we are getting ready to work out. I just did my warm up, which I did not show you guys because it's extra super boring. <clears throat> it's basically just like dumbbell death marches, goblet squats, and then knees over toe split lunges. Today, we have barbell hip thrusts to start the day off. Ah, hip thrusts, hip thrusts, hip thrusts. Man, I just realized too that my hair was sticking up as if I'm static shock in that last clip. I got my hair trimmed yesterday for the first time in three or four years. So it's not as long as it once was. That's why my bun is so small. I got such a small bun. Anyway, let's talk about building muscle with pot syndrome. How to go about it, how do you do it? Is it even possible to build muscle with pot syndrome? I would tend to think, yes sir, it is. So, the, uh, the tenets of building muscle, right? Progressive overload, intensity, volume. Those are basically the three things that I tell people to focus on when it comes to building muscle. And then you have all your little nuances like time under tension, which would basically just be like, how much time do you actually spend under the weight, under the load, things of that nature. Um, let's go over what I think is most important for people with POTS to focus on, especially when you're trying to get back into building muscle. Yeah, because there are some nuances. The tenants don't really change, but there are nuances and situations that you have to account for. All right, here are going to be the three points that we talk about today. I gave you the three basically main tenants of muscle building in general, but here are the three tenants that we are going to talk about in this video, and you can't even see it on this video because I'm looking at the screen, you can't see it. But anyway, first one is gonna be exercise selection. I think that that is the most important thing to think about, especially when you're starting to get back in the gym. Number two is gonna be your aerobic capacity. I'll talk to you about why I think that's so important when we hit the aerobic capacity part. Number three is gonna be your maximum recoverable volume, maximum recoverable volume, and your minimum effective dose. Let's go. 275 hip thrust, let's go. I think I have to do between four and six reps here is what the program calls for. I don't do my own programming, by the way. Most coaches have a coach, just so you know. Oof. Here we go. It's tempo too. Yes. Freaking yoked, bro. Exercise selection. Why is this so important? Mainly because people with POTS have a hard time tolerating certain positions. So I know that there's this notion out there and like a bunch of me heads would like you to believe that squats, bench, deadlift, um, good mornings, like all that stuff is the best way to maximize muscle building. That may be true just in the aspect of progressing and progressive overload is a little bit easier when you're using a barbell because you can do things like add one kilo or half a kilo or 1.5 you know, um, two and a halves to a bar and things of that nature, you can incrementally go up. That's the only benefit that you have when it comes to using a barbell and using more stress under load, things of that nature. A lot of people with POTS have positional, what would you say, intolerances, right? You need to figure out which exercises you can do that don't bother you, that don't make you symptomatic, that don't give you a reason to want to run out of the gym or freak out. So if most of the exercises that you need to do that are weight bearing are prone, so in the laying position like hamstring curls or maybe even seated such as leg extensions or leg presses or some sort of machine bench press instead, that is totally okay and you are totally able to build muscle while doing those things as long as you do it in a progressive manner, follow the tenant of progressive overload and intensity. We got the uh, we got the hip thrust done, so that was cool. 275 by six, four sets, and uh, now we're on to tempo no lockout front squats. These are my super favorite thing on earth to do. See how my knees are not locking out? This is that time under tension thing that I was talking about before. Ooh. All right, let's add some weight to this bar. Progressive overload. We're gonna go five pounds heavier than we did last week. 
All right, so I think that it might be worth it to talk about progressive overload and what exactly that idea is for the purpose of this video, because some of you guys may not know what that means or have even ever heard of that before. And it's a really popular thing that fitness gurus and people talk about and they mess it up a lot. Basically what progressive overload is, is just adding sets, reps, and load to the bar or to exercises over time, right? And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to stick to the same exercises over time. It's basically just the idea of getting stronger and making adaptations to training over time. It becomes important to stick to certain exercises for like a short period of time, maybe, you know, as, as short as like three weeks to up to 12 weeks, just so you can have measurable progress or you can undulate it or um, do kind of the conjugate style where you do one exercise one week, another one the next week, and then back to that first week on the third week, that type of thing. Let's not get too complicated here, but it's just adding total volume over time, getting stronger over time. And the reason why I think that progressive overload is so important for people with POTS is because oftentimes we don't think about that with aerobic training, progressively overloading your aerobic systems, right? And um, basically what that would mean is getting to a point where you, you are so aerobically fit, and this doesn't mean you can run like 10 miles or anything like that, but you're so aerobically fit that you're not having symptoms anymore because in my experience working with people with POTS, the aerobic fitness is really what is the game changer and then the, the muscular fitness is the icing on top and we'll talk about that way later in this video. But making sure that you're aerobically fit I think is very, very important and that goes into exercise selection as well. What can you tolerate? for aerobic fitness and aerobic workouts to add to it and progressing that over time. Okay, Justin, we're talking about building muscle. So why is point number two, aerobic capacity, so important? Good question, viewer. Now I have a question for you and I would like you guys to answer this in the comment section below. Can you hear how heavy I am breathing from weightlifting. I'll give you a second. Answer in the comment section below. Good. Now that we have that figured out, I think that this is a concept that I think is kind of overlooked with people who don't have POTS too, who are normal, not sick, normal, right? Not sick with a chronic illness. They don't realize how limited they can actually be in weightlifting by their aerobic system, by their aerobic fitness. A lot of times, people will chump out because they're not aerobically fit. Their muscles are not well adapted enough to utilize oxygen and get more reps. They are limited by their aerobic capacity. So, especially with, for people with POTS who are already limited in an aerobic sense, this is why it's so important because you don't wanna get gassed out when you hit four reps of a semi-heavy set of whatever it might be, right? The hypertrophy range is mainly from like six to 30 reps plus, as long as you match intensity. But intensity is a huge factor in this as well. Is that one of the things? Nope. Intensity. Intensity will be limited by your aerobic capacity and your ability to push past certain thresholds in training. So, if you're serious about building muscle, especially when you have POTS, aerobic training is bar none. One of the most important things that you need to make sure you have in check. And by the way, that by no means means that you need to be fit like a marathon runner or a crossfitter or anything like that. You just have to be fit enough where your limiter is not breathing too heavy. Subscribe to it. The hard thing that you don't force yourself into isn't harder than the other things that yeah. you know those things. My hamstrings are already like, you don't want to do this. Don't do this to us. It's getting windy out. I cannot believe I have two more sets of that. There are things in life that are a million times more difficult. All right, let's talk about the last two concepts here. Max recoverable, vo max recoverable volume. I don't know why I'm having such a hard time saying that. And minimum effective dose. Max recoverable volume is literally as it says. How much work can you do that you can still recover from? And minimum effective dose is how little work can you do that you still make progress? My approach to this is generally finding somebody's minimum effective dose, doing as little weightlifting as possible in the beginning or resistance training in general, so calisthenics, things of that nature, 
doing as little of that as possible to still see the results that you want to see in the gym. So are you building muscle? Are you making progress week to week to week every single week by doing little sets? And this is something that you have to find out yourself. You have to either get a coach to help you find it or you have to find out yourself, but it takes a little while. And then the max recoverable volume is more for somebody who's like nearing kind of what I would say the point of recovering from pot. Somebody who's getting in the gym more often, who's more experienced in the gym. Maybe it's been like, you know, a bunch of weeks and they, they don't have much many symptoms in the gym. Max recoverable volume. The important part there is you don't want to overload the nervous system. You don't want to do so much that you eventually do crash. So experimenting and playing with both concepts is really important. So again, max recoverable volume is how much work can you do in order to, in, to elicit an adaptation and a response from the body and not crash the nervous system so that you have some sort of, so you don't have a crash or a rebound. And then the minimum effective dose, how little can you do to still make progress and to build muscle? That's gonna be it for this video, guys. I hope that you did enjoy the video. I hope that it did help you in some way. If it did, please hit that like button if you enjoyed it and also subscribe if you are new. I'm enjoying making these videos for you guys again. We'll talk to you in the next one. Peace out, goodbye.